Hey, everybody. Uh, so I guess since this is going to be presentation oriented, let's not waste any time and let's get started. Uh, Tyler, the idea is you have the list and people will be sharing their own. Uh, one person from the team will be sharing their own screens. That's right. Um, so I can uh, send everyone should be able to see the list. Uh, it was since it was uh, posted in. Can you just uh, share that Discord. chat one more time? For yes, me? I'll do that right now. Or Slack? Yes, I'll do that right now. And I can look through that list. And I think the first group that signed up. Uh, I guess it's the first group is the frugal SEM. Uh, and uh, yeah. So right. the so, frugal SEM group, if you want to share, and then maybe in the very end, uh, Fabian can also just mention the historic aspects of uh, what's going on beyond the this team itself. But uh, do you guys want to share your screen, SEM team? Awesome. I just enabled sharing. Okay. Tanuj, you can go ahead. Tanuj will be the spokesperson today, so uh, I hope he's uh, online somewhere. He's online. He said he's ready to share. All right, let's go. Hey, Tanuj, are you here? <laughs> I know he's here because he just texted. Uh, can you hear me now? We can hear you. We can see your screen. All right, so I'll, I'll get started. So. Um, well, we are the frugal SEM team and SEM And I'll keep for... the timer just before we start. So Tyler, uh, for the total number of talks there are, what is the timer for talk? Um, so these are technically signed up at individual time slots, um, but I think we can do, no, let's- Just take the number of people, divide yeah, that. Yeah, so it's five minutes. Give that time. Okay, it's five, five minutes. minutes. Yeah. Um, and if it goes a little over, it should be all That's right. Fine. Go ahead, Tanuj. Okay. So uh, we are the frugal SEM team. The SEM, of course, stands for scanning electron microscope. And the idea was to make uh, SEMs frugally because they're very expensive. And just to give you an idea of why we like SEMs more than microscopes, here is an SEM image of a toothbrush. And even though it's not highly magnified, you can see the, the, depth, the, the depth of view and the focus is so good. So that's just a reminder of why we're doing this. So. Uh, there's many subsystems to an SEM that we can work on. And of course, we couldn't work on all of them, but here are the ones that we did work on. So we have to figure out a way to get a vacuum in there. And that's what Samir worked on. And we had to get high voltage sources. And that's what Lakshman and Sumed were working on. Um, the image that you get from an SEM, it needs to have a decent resolution for the human eye and also contrast. So that's what Toshali worked on. And the backscattered electrons from samples need to be detected. That's what I, uh, who's Tanuj, uh, we, I worked on. And of course, our, our mentor is uh, Fabian, who knows all of the above things. So we're very lucky to have him. So uh, I mean, just just gonna summarize what we've done so far. This is what Toshali had made uh, when she was trying to experiment to figure out how many. Um, uh, how many electrons we actually need for an image to actually have a good contrast and figure out what a good image looks like. So like uh, towards the end where there's, there's about 2,500 dots in here is where it, things start to appear more uh, with a better contrast. And well, Samir was able to get a pretty frugal vacuum. And in addition to that vacuum, he was also able to get an electric arc. So what he simply did was to use uh, a, a syringe and then get uh, an arc in there. Uh, uh, if Samir is online, he can speak about it. Samir, are you uh, online? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I just simply used a 50 um, milliliter syringe and made an one way valve and um, it was pretty easy to make and uh, and um, i'm able to um, boil water at room temperature with this um, setup and i'm using a glass jar 
and um, and I have uh, a voltage multiplier which uh, which is able to create two kilo volts. So that's just my work now. So I am working on it and I'll keep you all updated with this. Right. Yeah. So uh, that's the stuff that Samir had done. And I, I think it's pretty, I mean, one of the most frugal things that we've been able to achieve so far. Um, and like he had even graphed how we can get different amounts of vacuum with uh, different certain sizes. You can find this on our Notion page. Um, moving on to high voltage sources, uh, some of our initial ideas right now are using different kinds of generators and multipliers like Cockcroft Walton or Van de Graaff. And Fabian had an idea uh, to maybe connect a capacitor at the end of the generator so we get, I mean, around 0.01% variation in the voltage because we need a very uh, stable source. But we're still trying to figure out how to do this frugally and safely. Maybe be able to hook up a battery in the field so that we get a high voltage. And the electron detection is something that's really tricky to do frugally because you can very well just take up a silicon uh, or any kind of uh, um, light detector, but those are actually semiconductors that are expensive. So I'm looking at ways like, let's say, indoor lighting as a source of electrons for our experiments. So that was Team Frugal SEM. And even though the course is ending, this is just the beginning for this project. I'm personally very excited to see where this goes after uh, from now on. And please feel free to visit our Notion page. Thank you. That's fantastic. Awesome. Uh, Fabian, do you want to just say a word also about the broader effort that we have on the uh, Frugal SEM, just so everybody else is aware of, including the uh, electron sources and other threads? Because yes, uh, I think most folks in the class have not actually heard about the project that we've been working on. Yeah, I first met Manu uh, uh, in absentia at a meeting when he... Uh, gave a talk and when I got back to Stanford on the other side of the country uh, and he was describing the fold scope and I said, this is appeals to my sense of cheapness. He said, I want to do the same thing with an SEM. Uh, it's considerably more challenging if uh, you don't mind my saying so. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we've got a team working on it uh, on various aspects. So what we picked for um, this particular project, which I'm very glad got going because our regular projects pretty much on hold because of COVID. I'm stuck in a retirement community. I'm not allowed to go into the lab, for example, and I'm the sole team member at Stanford. We got um, an ex-student working at UBC on the source. Uh, it's a carbon nanotube source. So that I think we've got uh, under control and the lenses and things we've, we've got all that. In fact, we have got a picture uh, with a pumpless SEM, which we're pretty excited about. The vacuum that uh, Samir talked about, um, doesn't. we're not talking about a high vacuum for the electron tube, we're just talking about a low enough vacuum, like about the water vapor pressure um, to, for the sample chamber, so the electrons don't scatter too far out of emerging from the sealed tube uh, before they hit the sample about a millimeter away. Charlie is looking into how much scattering we get uh, at different pressures. She'll also be looking at the scattering that we get uh, as a result of the uh, beam being back scattered from the sample. So she'll be working pretty closely with um, Tanuj on the detector. Uh, to Charlie, I had to sort of take time out because I'm sorry to say her brother got a bad case of COVID. I don't yet know how that worked out. Uh, and the high voltage, we've had all kinds of ideas, as you heard about, and uh, initially I thought the Van de Graaff was completely off the wall and unsuitable. But then it occurred to me our current draw is so small that if you charge a capacitor and disconnect the Van de Graaff, uh, you might get a slow decay, but you can follow that with the computer. But there won't be any, um, any ripple or anything like that. So uh, I think these guys have come up with some really interesting ideas. And, Samir in particular with his syringe vacuum, I thought was really neat. And the check valve he made with a, a rubber hose and a couple of, and a ball bearing. So yeah, really exciting. Thanks very much. And I think the comment I want to make is again, this is really about the beginning of projects and uh, the broader teams uh, that coalesce around them. 
Uh, there is also a very low cost uh, voice coil based scanning stage Fabian and I have worked on that's uh, ready for somebody to take on as well. So we'll use the Notion page uh, as a, literally a lab notebook much more broadly for the, uh, the overall team essentially to make sure that uh, although there is distributed development, there is a single core place where all the sets of parts are documented. Uh, let's switch to the next team. Uh, I think the next is Locust Swarms. Uh, there's no individual listed who's going to do the. Uh, so the Locust Swarm team, the swarms can take over our screens now. You see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Give me one second. Okay. Awesome. Well, I can get started. That was the name of the original uh, Frugal SEM. It's called Awesome. So. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say that. Go ahead, Taylor. No worries. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'll be presenting today on behalf of Locust Swarms, and I'm really excited to share with you the progress that we've made over the last 10 weeks targeting frugal science approaches for, you know, the really huge and global scale challenge of Locust Swarms. Um, and so I just kind of want, again, kind of impress how big this problem is, and we're definitely not the first people to think of this very, very old historic plague of Locust Swarms, but I think what has been very striking is that um, even today in 2020, locust swarms are a huge threat in parts of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, and will continue to worsen with the effects of climate change. Um, I want to give a little bit about the problem scope. I know we did this kind of um, our, in our last presentation, but locusts are, for the most part, these kind of like really humble grasshoppers, but with chemical and environmental cues that are exacerbated with the effects of climate change, they kind of morph into this gregarious state and they turn bigger and hungrier and faster and just scarier in a lot of different ways. And so they kind of band together in these huge swarms that can reach up to about 2,400 square kilometers with millions, hundreds of millions of locusts per square kilometer. Um, and like I said, they are very hungry. So they eat as much food as about 35,000 people can in a single day. Um, and again, what's been interesting, and I'm sure a lot of us have found this in researching our problems is that, especially in the context of COVID, um, there are a lot of kind of like problems that pile on. And there's a prediction with um, locust swarms in combination with the novel coronavirus, a combined 42 million people in Eastern Africa and Yemen will experience um, very acute food insecurity. Um, and what we won't go through today in this short presentation is just how much work we've done to kind of actually map out the huge, like this big problem space. Um, there are a lot of wonderful things people are doing in terms of like monitoring and predicting and like building predictive models to like um, track um, different breeding sites and swarms. Um, but something that really kind of impressed on us was during one of our conversations with a farmer in Somaliland, um, a self-declared country. Um, and they expressed a lack of funding, especially as neighboring countries don't recognize local storms as a huge issue. Um, but we know locusts don't care about borders and also a lack of funding have led to a huge lack of solutions, especially at the individual scale. And even with a lot of these really cool monitoring and tracking solutions that are ongoing, um, they take a lot of capital to develop and deploy and also don't reach all communities. And so this led us to really make sure that small scale farmers and literal grassroots organizations are a part of our frugal science solution. Um, this is, I just wanna kind of throw our proposed solution space here. And this is definitely at the ideas level and not so much numbers. Um, and of course we would love feedback, um, but on one side of our research, we learned that sound waves are a really interesting way to modulate swarms. On one end, high frequency waves can be used to disturb swarms, but on the other end, low frequency waves can be used to attract swarms. But obviously that's not enough because even if you disturb swarms, they can just go over to the next farm, which is also not a great solution. And so there kind of has to be some way to actually attract and capture swarms. Um, so this kind of leads us to our solution space too, where through a lot of our interviews, we found that like there are different chemical and carbohydrate rich food and um, just different vertical visual attractants that can attract locusts. Um, we kind of imagine a second module as a system or a box to kind of capture and that would have to simultaneously kill locusts. 
And the third module being some kind of like extractor to decompose um, dead locusts as a food source or a compost fertilizer. And we kind of imagine this like self-contained box where farmers can deploy in the different corners of their crop fields. Um, and what do we need moving forward? So a lot of this is research. And so I can imagine a lot of y'all have already thought of a lot of questions kind of with the solution space of like, how do we actually kill locusts? Like how big does the net need to be? What kind of attractants should we use? How do we actually extract dead locusts from a net? Um, so there's a lot of things we're still exploring. In parallel, we're also thinking about what is a good quantifiable metric? Um, and actually how do we promote research and testing and sharing kind of at the local level um, to promote um, open sharing of data. And this is our team and thank you so much. And I've linked our Notion page and more materials. Awesome, that was exactly five minutes. Uh, I guess maybe as a quick one second question, could you just answer uh, on the ultrasound, uh, how well is the frequency bands known is sound used by locusts by themselves? Uh, clearly because, you know, many grasshoppers and these species have um, sound detectors in their legs. Mm -hmm. So from the context of what in the biology of this organism is tuned towards sound. Mm -hmm. And do you want to say a word or two about that? Mm -hmm. And if Raghav is here, um, I believe he can speak more to this, but from what I understand, especially at the high frequency end, um, they, Bats are a huge predator of them. And so they have been like trained to kind of like sense these like high frequency sound waves that come from bats and have, you know, mm -hmm. have been seen to kind of, you know, break out from them. So I think that's kind of where that biology comes from. Yeah, that's just by that, that by itself, it's just so beautiful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay, let's keep uh, switching along. The next is Fruglu. All right, I'm gonna share my screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right, hello everyone. We are Team Frugal, and our goal is to find a frugal way to measure blood glucose level. But why we want to do that? Because glucose measurement is a major part of diabetes management. But despite this fact, the current cost, which is around $1 per test, is not accessible to millions of people with diabetes. So with this goal in mind, we looked into possibilities. There were so many options available to us. We were so happy. I mean, look at this slide. <laughs> so we, we could take invasive approach, minimal invasive approach, non-invasive approach, but of course, as an ambitious group, we chose non-invasive methods. So we also picked optical method over non-optical methods, thinking that we can use our cameras on the cell phone or webcams to, for our measurements. And also we had Benedict and Manu for support. Then we looked into polarimetry and near infrared spectroscopy. The research that we did show promising results, hinting that they could work for glucose measurement. So it took us around seven weeks to realize that we had been hunting the deceitful turkey. So it was better, better late than never. We pivoted to invasive method this time, and now we are working on intermittent blood analysis for glucose measurement. With this introduction, I will turn it over to Deep to talk about the experiments that the team did. Right, thanks Taki. Um, yeah, so we are really excited about this prospect of using light as a way to like measure blood glucose. And in order to learn more about, you know, how light can actually be used, we started doing simple experiments with the stuff flying around us. Like um, on this slide, you can see some experiments that Deborah did with some photographic films that are that were lying around her and um, the infrared light coming out of a remote control, just playing around, just learning the properties of light as we go along. Um, Taki, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, yeah, the one before, sorry. Yeah, and there was an assignment for building a DIY spectrometer, which we did 
And on the go again, we learned about the principles of spectroscopy and how that is relevant for identifying uh, and hopefully measuring glucose in blood. Um, next slide, please. So the current track that we're on right now was suggested by Manish, which is basically using um, polarization microscopy to observe a crystallized form of glucose. So what we have done is, uh, and Benedict has helped us to build this setup. So we have used a microscope and observed, say, a dried solution of glucose under it and a blood smear. So the hope is that if, if the level of glucose changes, there will be, it'll show up somehow in the crystallization patterns, which we can observe and hopefully quantify with this technique. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, yeah, this is the setup that Benedict has helped us to make, and this is what we have been working on in the like, last week and this week. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so the hope is finally to use um, tools from the frugal science community developed by Manu, such as the hand diffuse to separate out components of blood, which will make our observation easier. Right now, the red blood cells are interfering with observing any kind of crystals of glucose. So we hope to use a hand diffuse to separate out the components, and then hopefully we will be able to observe crystals under a fold scope. And hopefully, we're gonna continue working on this, and the hope is to get the cost of glucose measurements lower. So I'll end at that, and we are continuing to work on it, and your feedback would be really appreciated. Thank you. So that was fantastic. Uh, and also, I think one thing that you highlight in the beginning, uh, Chagi, was just with so many approaches, it's really important to just begin. And it's perfectly okay as you go along to pivot as you find new information. Uh, maybe one uh, quick comment uh, that would be valuable to make is, and again, this is just for the future because these projects will continue, is to do a calculation of what is the precision that somebody needs to know their blood glucose with. And from that back calculate to be able to say, ah, you know, for it to be useful, this is the level of precision that's needed. And hence these sets of techniques are in and these types of techniques are out. So I don't know if that's already, the team has already discussed that. And if not, it would be very valuable because of course there are certain sets of things you can measure something at an infinite precision, but might not be physiologically relevant and might not be based on the decision that a person makes whether I should give myself a shot or not. So any right. comments on that? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's super useful feedback. Um, I think we, we still need to go back to do more research also. So we, we kind of go in ways from experiments back to research mm -hmm. and- yeah. And don't think of it as that you would do research and then do an experiment and it's done. This cycle is very natural. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And if anyone else has any idea, like if you get ideas from the stuff that we show also in the video, we show a few more of our experiments, like maybe we can also measure something else where this could be useful, right? Then please get in touch with us. Mm -hmm. And then there is a Notion page is linked. Uh, some, I guess what we will do is we will list the Notion pages on the, uh, the class website. So anybody else in the classes who wants to engage with other teams as well, now will have the chance to engage. Uh, let's move to the Ant family. Yeah, so good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I am Akifa, and I will be speaking on behalf of the Ant family. Um, Akifa, do you want to share your screen? Um, yeah, actually, uh, team member is doing that. Got it. <laughs> yeah. So our project aims at quantifying ant population for monitoring environmental health. Yeah, so next slide, please. So when you see these headlines, such as massive insect decline, biodiversity loss, insect numbers are plummeting. So these headlines are haunting us every now and then. So the thing is, humans don't matter to insects, but insects do matter to us. So 
um, by quantifying ants, this is a smaller step which will help in uh, greater answering bigger questions like how do you tackle biodiversity loss? So how does ants, how do ants come into picture here? So firstly, they act as bioindicator species. Then also they maintain balance in the ecosystem. And thirdly, which is the most important thing is they provide us ecological services like seed dispersal, pollination, and decomposition. So if these insects go extinct, we would have to artificially provide these services and which would be costly. So um, by studying ants, we somehow hope to extrapolate these findings through our project to bigger cause, uh, to a bigger cause like environmental health monitoring. So next slide, please. So the problems which we faced while working on this project was first and foremostly identification. Since the ant size is quite small, um, we could not identify it properly. Then next was, uh, since we wanted it to be a citizen science project, so we were searching for frugal ways. So we used a phone camera. So from that also, we couldn't capture Im uh, quality images. And then there was this taxonomic key usage. So what happens in there is there is scientific terms. So common people would not easily understand that. So even we as a team are working on figuring out how do we make it easy to understand. Then um, we also wanted to make an app through which you know the user can upload the image of the ant and they would get the genus and species level and we would get the data which would we would require to make the data um, app. So what happened is uh, we need lots of data and but we are lacking that data. So we need to collect data from different sources. So then there was one problem and then we were faced with community building and citizen science. So our target audience was college students, school going children, naturalists, nature enthusiasts. So how do we um, build the community? How do we get them into our project? How do we get them into a contributing to our project? So that was one more thing that was a problem. So next slide, please. Uh, so the, these are our solutions. So for the app development part, we would like to crowdsource data from different sources. And we would also like to involve the full scope community, which is the microcosmos and encourage them to take images of the ants, which they find. And so we can develop the app this way. And we need images of ants, lots of images for the algorithm to function efficiently. And if all goes well, if this all goes well, we would want to establish a section called Ants of India on a pre-existing database. It's in India. It's called the India Biodiversity Atlas. So it is an amazing website. You should go look it out. We will attach the link in the chat. So there are different databases of a different groups of insects and animals. So we would want to do that in the long term. Then moving ahead to the citizen science initiative. So for that, we thought, why not develop a booklet called Ants of India? And as most of our team members are from India, we thought, let's start from India. So what this book will consist of is how to identify ants in an easy to understand way, then um, which species are found in India. Then for the kids, uh, we can make uh, cook fun activities, do it yourself activities. Example, uh, find an anthill outside your house and then take a picture of that, stick it in your book and related stuff, thinking on those similar lines. Then moving ahead, um, next slide please. Um, this is our team. We are mostly from the biology background and in the future, we look forward to collaborating with ant taxonomists and professional computer science and machine learning people. So this is our basic plan and we will take this forward and we will work on this in the upcoming months. And that's it. And in the end, we would like to thank you, Dr. Manu Prakash and Tyler Chan for um, this amazing course and connecting us with people worldwide. Thank you. Uh, okay, so a couple of quick comments. Um, I think in our prior discussion, we had discussed this a little bit, but I'm curious if you were able to follow through on uh, 
is the head morphology of an ant sufficient for identifying it to either a species level or a genus level? I'm just curious uh, because, you know, I think you have a really interesting challenge that ants come in many different sizes. Hmm. And there is a ton of data already in the microcosmos community, for example, on ants, but it's all focused on just the head, for example. So the question is, and of course, head morphology by itself is quite unique in many ants. Has that been analyzed at all? If you were to take 30, 40 species, the most common species, but you don't have a full image, but you have a high resolution image of just the head. Yeah, yeah. so regarding the... Yeah, yeah so if I, should I go? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so with respect to head, there are some antennal clubs which some ants have based on which you can point, pinpoint to a subfamily and sometimes even to genus level. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, it is possible, but uh, like, I, like Akifa said, some ants are very small. So even the phone camera cannot focus and even the magnifying glass to some extent, we cannot mm -hmm. expect citizen science scientists to use that. Yeah, um, but so I think the, the comment I meant was literally already the full scope community is extremely large. Uh, there's around 1.5 full scope, 1.5 million full scope losers, users currently. And what that does is it gives us the scenario of, but it's harder to capture both the full ant and the head because under a microscope, you can really see the head very well. Yes. And so if you can confirm that, uh, that would be a, a straightforward thing for us to do is to send a request to just users around as your first data set, unless you have yeah, other yeah, data sets. Yes. Yeah, so let's follow up on that. Yes, so there are some photos on the Notion page with respect to the antennal clubs that I mentioned, which are a part of the head. So people who want to explore that can go to our Russian page and you can find them under the photos section. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have taken yeah. photos from Foldscope. Uh, yeah. So there are some there. And also please go through the eight minute video that we had shot. There are more details in that. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's jump to reduce lab waste. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So hi, my name is Nehal Devedi and I'll be talking on behalf of my team that is Reduce Lab Based. So let's begin. So I would like to start my presentation with this picture. I've often observe that people who are quite diligent in their personal life with recycling, driving energy efficient cars, going for eco-friendly alternatives to plastic, then turn a blind eye to their plastic use once they cross the threshold of the lab. So as you can see in this picture, we as a scientist are surrounded by plastic everywhere for each and every small experiment. So we are a huge contributor of this plastic waste which are generated worldwide. So, uh, our team hopes to make a positive step towards solving this global issue. So, uh, let me first talk about how uh, big this issue is. And to, for that, I'll show you a few data. So, to raise awareness for this issue, the journal eLife started an initiative on Twitter, hashtag Lab Waste Day. They asked all the scientists to post a picture of the plastic waste they generated in a single day along with its weight. I have taken few screenshots from the Twitter and as you can see here, this amount ranged from 250 grams to 6 kgs of plastic produced by one single person per day. So you can just imagine the amount we create uh, on an individual level per year. It's quite huge, right? So our team who, from all the different types of plastic where's used in labs, our team is currently focusing on a very commonly used plastic consumable that is pipette tip. Although the plastic waste from pipette tip disposal might initially seem small, but since most labs use pipette tips just once before discarding them, these tips can accumulate dramatically. So now the question is, how can we reduce the pipette tip waste? And the solution is very simple, just by reusing them. So in order to reuse this pipe tips, we need to have a system which can clean the used micro tips. By uh, 
researching on an on our idea further we found that there is an already existing instrument which does the job of cleaning the used tips and the instrument is called tip novice however the cost of the device is insanely huge and it cost about $50000 and the job of the device is to clean the used micro tips that's it i mean it will give you a very clean tips but paying $50000 for that machine i personally believe it's crazy <laughs> so our idea is to build a frugal version of pipette tip washer so we plan to have three main components in our tip washer cleaning unit drying unit and a sterilization unit the first step is washing so uh, we propose to apply the principle of sonication within our device to clean the tips sonication is a process in which high frequency sound waves causes the formation of small cavitation bubbles which agitates the liquid this agitation will generate a force onto the contaminants attached to the tips thereby removing the firmly adhered residuals from the surface of the tips used micro tips will be there so what we will be doing we will be suspending putting the used micro tips inside a tank containing the cleaning solution this cleaning solution can be a mild detergent which will be diluted in water if required the tips can be soaked for a specific duration before starting the ultrasonic cleaning cycle so the tips will be first cleaned using a cleaning solution followed by that we will have two cycles of washing with normal water and a final rinsing step with distilled water so a tank will also have an outlet pipe so that we can easily discard all the solutions after every washing cycle and we plan to uh, uv treat our liquid waste before finally discarding it a next step is uh, drying so for one suggestion was to spray alcohol to evaporate the excess liquid along with this we thought of using a dryer which will be very similar to the hair dryer which we use so the hot air from the dryer will help in drying the the final step is sterilization for that we plan to have a small uv box or a chamber where the tips would be placed for final sterilization step also we one can also go for autoclaving now at this moment we are just uh, in the process of coming with the we have just come up with this idea now our future work involves building a designing a device building a prototype and um, look we need to look for an assay to ensure the effectiveness of the system in cleaning the tips we will also have to standardize the entire washing protocol with respect to the concentration of detergent number of washes time duration of each cleaning cycle and uv sterilization cycle also we need to perform a test to study whether the accuracy and precision in pipetting minute volumes is affected whether the with the number of washes we uh, carry out by using every time and the most important thing over here will be to perform a cost analysis if people still find that the tips they can buy tips more uh, cheap uh, in a cheap fashion rather than buying this machine then i don't think so it is going to be of any use so we have to make sure that the cost of this device is uh, really less and also the final would be to do a environmental analysis of environmental benefits of a product so thank you and i would like to I have some suggestions and comments on this uh, entire yeah. idea. So Nehal, that was fantastic. It's very well thought out. And I think the last bit that you mentioned about how you benchmark your solution is really at the heart of much of what you described. A, a quick comment on, have you been able to identify literature in the pre-published established protocols on cleaning tips that you can rely on uh, as compared to, you know, because I can imagine a very broad range of assays would have to be developed because pipettes are touching many different class of chemicals. So I'm just curious, is there anything that's published that you can rely on or the methods that you know in already existing machines that are being used in the space? So the, there is not much of information about the already existing machine. If they are using similar process of ultra sonification okay. and similar step but um, uh, regarding the data whether we can rely 
to where we can rely on that one i found quite interesting was there was a uh, data where it was given what all detergents can be used for different types of things so i thought that can be useful in deciding a cleaning solution but regarding other protocols we could not find anything quite useful for us mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of literature in decontamination of medical products and things like that. It would be valuable, but in an additional step, you have this uh, added aspect of making sure that uh, a very broad range of chemicals are actually removed. Um, let's switch to team uh, paper ricks. And of course, you have many users if you develop a protocol amongst so many wet bench users uh, would be very happy to actually provide data. We should just as, as members all do that uh, lab waste challenge. That sounds like a fantastic thing to do. Uh, so back to the PaperX team. Yes, um, so hello everybody. We are team PaperX and we started off with the question, can we use paper microfluidics for disease diagnostics? But uh, after our meeting with uh, our mentor, Professor Manu, we decided to use the concepts of using millifluidics to detect schistosomiasis. So schistosomiasis is a tropical disease which is caused by the um, schistosomiasis hematobium. And uh, we actually uh, wanted to detect the eggs of the schistosomias, schistosoma eggs in the urine sample of the patients. And we came up with two prototypes about which uh, Shrista will explain more. So over to you, okay. Shrista. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the main challenge is that there are just a few eggs in a very large volume of urine. Uh, so next slide. So uh, we had to come up with methods to uh, filter it. So we tried out a uh, previous slide. Uh, so we tried out uh, uh, the other way. Yeah. So we tried uh, a, a range of papers, first of all, to uh, find the perfect uh, pore size for filtration. And uh, we also uh, um, explored many kirigami and origami uh, methods to concentrate. And uh, we also tried out uh, adding oil to match the refractive index so that we can image the eggs in a better way without any obstruction from the paper. Next slide. So this is our uh, first prototype. So it's a very basic uh, filter. Uh, so it's a coffee filter insert design. Uh, next slide. So to concentrate the eggs in a better way, we've come up with our second prototype. So to the image to your left, you can see the hand cut version. So you do need a laser cutter or a, a circuit cutter for precise cutting, which you can see to your right. Next slide. So this, um, so this illustration demonstrates the working of our prototype. Uh, so you draw the urine uh, through the syringe and then attach the filter and uh, pull the plunger. So after the filtration process is done, you remove the filter, add a drop of oil and image it under a fold scope. So this uh, second prototype was uh, more effective and uh, we were able to control the uh, urine in a better way. So for testing, uh, we've used the same sized uh, coriander ground and, uh, as a replacement for Shisuzoma X and uh, water as a uh, proxy urine. So, and of course there, are, there is a negative aspect that's plastic waste. So I think the previous group will be able to help us with that. There are multiple groups also working on uh, non-plastic based syringes as well. So there's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so looking at the conclusion and future work, um, uh, the, this is what you are seeing is a parallel manufacturing, uh, uh, the distributed manufacturing pathway, uh, which goes through the industries and maker spaces and home fabricators. And the materials uh, can be sourced directly from the uh, paper manufacturers or, it, or from the uh, local stores. Uh, we envision this tool to be open source uh, so that maximum and easy outreach can be achieved. Uh, next slide. So uh, looking at the future work, uh, our first step is to test the uh, second prototype uh, in a medical setting uh, where original cystosoma eggs in the urine will be tested. And uh, after that, uh, standardization of prototype uh, uh, will be done wherein we'll be looking for uh, like a proper protocol for diagnosis and testing of cystosomiasis. 
uh, another thing which we are really looking uh, forward to is is a, is actually a collaboration with one of the team of uh, Rubel Science uh, to find and make an enzyme which will dissolve the filter filter material, uh, which will make it easy for uh, the um, for, which, which will make it easy for detection of eggs through uh, imaging through fold scope, and uh, finally the most important thing is to uh, uh, is the outreach and uh, reaching people to actually test this kit in a local setting. Uh, next slide. So yeah, this is the uh, speculated cystosomiasis diagnostic testing. Uh, and um, this is also on our Notion page and I request all of you to please go through it. Next slide. So yeah, this is a beautiful team which we got. <laughs> And this, uh, and we work together. We almost most of the people are from uh, biology background, and uh, few are from engineering. And uh, Corin is designing, so that was a great help. Next slide, please. And uh, at the end, we'd like to thank Kevin Land and Isaac Larkin for their time and uh, sharing their expertise, and also Manu, of course, uh, for being the mentor all the uh, for giving all the uh, ideas and uh, more importantly, giving this platform, uh, which led to genesis of such an important and good project. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, please visit our Notion page and if there is any opportunity of collaboration or if you are interested uh, in working with us, then everybody is welcome. You can contact anybody, any, anyone, of the, anyone from the team. Thank you. So that was fantastic. A, a quick comment associated with this, whenever we go out to the field for uh, schistosomiasis uh, sampling, one of the common thread that's used is uh, because it is done in a community basis, schools are used as primary testing centers. So even when I go to the field, when we work with the doctors, they have scheduled visit to all schools where they will gather you know, 50 or 100 students and essentially ask them to give urine samples. And then it's basically a marathon of collecting that. And I think one of the threads that I like about this is decoupling it to a community-based factor where somebody external doesn't have to come to do a sampling uh, while this is as part of a, say, a school curriculum even, or a, one staff member at the school is, uh, so I think, as you are thinking about the community implementation, choose one implementation scenario, just choose schools, because mm -hmm. most schistosomiasis surveillance is currently done in schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would be very valuable to combine it in this context of uh, what can be done, what does the throughput look like, and who would be the sets of folks who would actually be executing, because it's mm -hmm. quite unique as compared to many other diseases where uh, kids are asked to come, uh, much of schistosomiasis surveillance work is done in a very specific community. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, okay, let's keep moving along. Uh, let's jump to- Algae. Uh, toxic algaes. I know we're running a little bit out of time, uh, but we also know that there are lots of slots in the end that are open. So I think we should be okay for today. Next week, we'll have to figure out some other way of uh, uh, tightly regulating this, but I'm, yeah. So let's jump to toxic algae. All right, hi everybody. Uh, this is Team Toxic Algae Blooms and uh, decided to be here and kind of show what we've been working on. Uh, so I don't know how to get this in present mode. Um, you can also present like this. We can see the screen, it's all okay. good. Yeah. Okay, great, yeah. yeah. So as we said, we're Team Algae Blooms. And uh, Ben Ginkley is presenting here with me, and I'll pass it off to Ben. Cool, yeah, so what are we talking about? Phytoplankton are some of the oldest and most abundant organisms on Earth, and harmful algal blooms um, usually coincide with a change in the phytoplankton community structure, where toxin-producing species become significantly more abundant very quickly. There are a lot of different organisms that produce toxic compounds. They're in every ocean, they exist in freshwater environments. So with this mass diversity, we decided to focus our attention specifically on the pseudo Nichia genus in the Pacific environment. Next slide. Yeah, and uh, so the question here kind of turned into is uh, just to state the problem. Can we develop a frugal method to detect harmful algae blooms, specifically uh, pseudo Nichia? 
particularly early before they get uh, around and cause too much damage. So we considered a variety of approaches to address this problem. Uh, the three being listed here are TLC, uh, frugal fluorimetry, and frugal flow imaging. Um, so due to the sake of time, uh, TLC is uh, thin layer chromatography. It's used in organic chemistry a lot to separate mice and their polarity. Uh, so there's two ways that you could go about this harmful algae bloom problem. One is that they cause a colorimetric change in the water. And the other is they actually release these toxins, which are neurotoxins. So a potential route to be, since these are very highly polar compounds, uh, using TLC with the polar mobile phase to separate them out uh, and see if we can detect them early in the that way. Um, but we kind of tabled this idea early due to the nobody on the team really had a serious amount of expertise in paper-based diagnostics and um, sample preparation needs to citizen science may be challenging. So we spent a lot more time considering fluid fluorimetry. Uh, fluorimetry is a technique that is used to detect the fluorescent signal of molecules based on uh, their excitation, the wavelengths of excitation that are going to excite the plants. So this is building off of Emmanuel Boss's previous work where he developed a frugal form. Um, in his work, he had, a, it was a single channel looking to detect levels of chlorophyll using a blue LED uh, at 420 nanometers with a red filter to only let through the red light, which is where it emits in, and then detecting it via photodiode. So we wanted to expand this design to be able to include three different uh, fluorescent readouts. Uh, so having a sample reservoir that you can pull in the ocean, uh, it through this flow through design in an acrylic sample tube, uh, and then driving these LEDs and turning them on and off at different levels uh, from this Arduino. And then putting this all in a casing, first of all, to act as a Faraday cage to uh, disperse uh, rogue EM signals that may come from this pump. And second of all, to make everything dark, so this fluorometric reading might have a chance of being used in the daytime. Um, so this is currently, these are three uh, photosynthetic pigments found in Nisha, uh, chlorophyll A, uh, phycocyanin, and a carotene. And this would be the design for that. But what's nice about this is it could be a modular apparatus, then you could just switch depending on the species you're looking at. Um, However, this comes with a huge caveat that this is very much in the design stages, and uh, this is a non-specific approach, meaning that a lot of harmful algae blooms will have all three of these photosynthesis. So not necessarily uh, detection, but more of a, or specific detection, more of like a detection. Here you go, Ben. All right, yeah. And so you can kind of consider flow imaging microscopy to a big sibling of fluorometry. With imaging, you can get more information, but this comes at the cost of usually more expensive devices, as well as a larger power consumption footprint. So the step up usually requires going from an Arduino, like we saw in the last design, up to at least a Raspberry Pi to actually collect and process the images, for example. Um, so while this is fine for benchtop devices, it does complicate field deployment and it makes it almost impossible to run just on battery power for a long time out in the environment. Um, but the good news is that while commercial products are ridiculously inaccessible, Flowcam Imaging Flow Cytobot, they range in the price of $100,000 per unit. Um, Manu's lab and my lab at Northeastern have been developing imaging devices that are orders of magnitude reduced cost and still produce high quality images. Um, so, you know, there's hope for this. The, the one caveat to this approach is it is a step up in cost and again in power consumption compared to fluorometry. So there's a trade-off here. Next slide. Yeah, so we're trying to kind of strike a middle ground here of having a frugal app device that we can use and deploy in the field and then com combine this with a citizen science approach. So uh, as there's, uh, as we've learned, legions of citizen science oceanographers that go out in their boats, uh, if this device was readily buildable and deployable, we could uh, hand that to them and then present them with a forum where they could log their data and over time accumulate some baseline measurements. So this is just a website we mocked up and this is uh, uh, not a finished product, but this is just kind of a schematic to say what we were thinking of. And uh, so give a little logical overview. So you build or purchase the fluorometer if we go that route, uh, take it out to sea, take some measurements and then record your data. And the recording will look something like this. So if you were in the Pacific Ocean sailing, uh, around a certain time and you mark your coordinates down, then you could record the, the output of your telemetry reading. And oh, and the caveat being that most times this is gonna be happening, these are gonna be relatively standard. Uh, they should be if there's no harmful algae bloom, but this will give us a means if there is a disturbance in the signal that that might be an indicator that there is a harmful algae bloom coming and uh, this will accumulate as citizens use it uh, uh, in their recreation or work. 
Yeah, so our team has a lot of room for additional collaborators, both for the prototype development side and then also designing the deployment strategies and connecting with communities who might actually use this. And you can go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, we just like to first acknowledge the outstanding work of Emmanuel Boss and BP Kale, who you know our fluorometry design is kind of built upon and expanded on. And we also have our contact info on this page, as well as a link to our Notion page for anyone who wants to get in contact with us to contribute further. Thanks. So that's fantastic. I think one uh, quick comment. Uh, I love the Emmanuel Boss's username. He is a boss. <laughs> uh, on a serious note, uh, one of the big things that's starting to happen, both for Plankton Scope, between Kale, Emmanuel, and maybe five or 10 research groups in France, we've been developing a community that's called Plankton Planet. So Plankton Scope is one instrument in the broader umbrella of Plankton Planet. And one of the big goals there is to develop a large number of instruments for a breadth of technologies and have this community as a way to deploy tools for sailboats. So I think as this proceeds, one of the obvious thing to try out would be is uh, there is a trial recruitment that we do for sailors and some of those sailors could actually also take, some of them are much more tech savvy than others. And so we have identified certain users who are able to both provide feedback on the instrument, but also actually collect data. So we should, we should catch up on that front uh, to make sure because the first sets of deployments for those would be in three or four months from now. And that would be just about a right time to be thinking about whether there is a uh, ocean hardy instrument that's ready and which is the hardest challenge in all of this is it can work in the lab but it has to work in a very harsh seawater type environment with electronics being truly and some of the cost actually genuinely for robust tools comes from that and I think we've been thinking quite a lot about how to build and make plankton scope and many of those instruments robust enough to seawater so lots to catch up on and then there is another group in Chile uh, which uh, I'll connect at a later time, uh, I guess, uh, in relationship to this. That's another test site. Yep, thank you. Uh, let's jump. Awesome. To Next up is Frenzymes. Frenzymes, yeah. That's still one of my favorite names. <laughs> I have to say, Fruglu was is kind of leading for my chart. Right? Yeah, Fruglu is a close second. Yeah. Uh, and then make sure people should keep asking questions in the chat because we're running this really like a tight ship. But of course, all of you have ideas and questions. So please uh, keep the chat as the place. And much of the chat is also recorded. So folks can then go back and keep answering questions. All right, can everybody see I my screen? Yeah. OK, cool. I'll present somewhere. button if you're looking is all the way on the right, by the way. And the oh, ah, hit, hidden by the, hidden by the yeah. uh, uh, Zoom uh, toolbar. <laughs> Got it. All right, hi everybody, I'm Isaac Larkin. I'm uh, part of Team Frenzymes and we're trying to democratize the means of biotechnological production. Um, what that means in practice is, uh, you know, enzymes, these, these atomic machines uh, are the sort of core elements required to do biological processes and biotechnological processes as well. Um, and they're really expensive and hard to access, especially for people who are outside academia and industry or people who are in developing countries that don't have well-developed bioeconomies already. Um, and so, you know, they cost hundreds of dollars, not even commercial suppliers uh, uh, can make them sometimes during times of crisis, like the COVID-19 pandemic, like we're seeing this uh, massive uptick in cases and we're starting to see shortages in, in diagnostic uh, enzymes uh, as a result. Um, and so, uh, our, our goal is to see if we can leverage some of the, the projects uh, for low cost enzyme production uh, uh, and, and, and tool sets for open source wetware to really uh, drop the cost and the skills uh, required to make these beautiful atomic machines uh, freely available for, or cheaply available for many people. Um, so the goal here is to design and assemble a, a frugal protein production and purification process. Um, there are a bunch of steps that go into protein production and purification, including what cells, what strains you choose to make your protein, how you design the plasmids and where you get those uh, genetic constructs for, for the recombinant protein production, how you do the fermentation to actually grow up the cells and get them to uh, manufacture your protein of interest, how you extract the proteins from the cells into like a crude protein lysate, 
in how you purify that crude protein lysate into the purified version of the protein that you want at different levels of purity for different applications. And then finally, how do you measure that? How do you, uh, how do you quantify your yield and your purity? And so we've, we've been uh, basically, the main thing we've been doing is fact finding and uh, talking to a bunch of uh, uh, brilliant people um, about uh, this and trying to assemble their knowledge into one place. So we've talked to Keone, who used to lead this free genes project and is, works a lot with Bacillus Subtilis on frugal distribution of genetic parts. Uh, Fernand Federici is an open science hardware expert and a professor of synthetic biology in Chile. Uh, Chiara Gandini is a postdoc at the Open at the Open Bioeconomy Lab and leads the Open Enzyme uh, Initiative. Scott Ponal has worked with me on the Free Genes Project and has developed, developed a whole collection for yeast. Sebastian Kachoba is one of the best DIY bio uh, engineers in the world, and Dushant Sivaratnam uh, is a, a, a PhD candidate at uh, Cambridge who specializes in um, sand-based purifications of protein. And so. Basically, let's let's go through the different pro uh, steps and uh, what we've uh, done so far on them. So, in terms of cell and strain selection, the standard way that like you know research labs make proteins is with E. coli because it's easy to use um, and everybody knows how to use it. And there are a lot of genetic tools available. Uh, but our approach is to go more towards what industry uses, which is which are namely Bacillus subtilis as bacteria and Pickia pastoris as yeast. And the reason is these uh, cell types are really good at secreting enzymes. And if you can secrete the enzymes out of the cell, then you can streamline a whole bunch of the downstream processing and bypass a whole bunch of equipment that would otherwise be very expensive. And so um, we're pursuing these two as, as platforms for our enzyme production. And then in terms of plasmid designing and ordering, the standard method for this is either buying commercial plasmids or getting custom genes synthesized, which costs hundreds or thousands of dollars, um, or you can buy the plasmids from the ad gene plasmid repository, and then they cost $80 a plasmid, and you're forbidden from resharing the plasmids due to the material transfer agreement. So our approach is to use and contribute to the free genes and open enzyme projects, which distribute uh, collections of wetware for free and under an open MTA that allows you to modify and reshare re and commercialize or do whatever you want with the, with the genetic parts you uh, receive. And in particular, uh, they're now distributing the sandbox of nearly 200 parts uh, that, in, that include an assembly standard that allows you to just uh, make these nice tags for potentially purifying enzyme applications that have like purification tags on them, reporter tags on them, uh, cleavage tags to cut things off. It's just a really nice collection and we're contributing to that. And we actually, we've already contributed a little bit of wetware uh, to that. We've designed and submitted these library plasmids uh, of bacillus subtilis um, secretion signal peptides. Uh, so basically try to make it cheaper and easier to screen for um, pair uh, secretion tags that pair well with a given enzyme and make uh, the bacillus efficiently secrete that enzyme. Um, so then there's the fermentation. So the standard method here is like you use either baffled glass shaker flasks, and these can cost tens to hundreds of dollars depending on the size of the flask. Or you can use bioreactors, which are sort of larger scale uh, and have more bells and whistles for controlling pH and temperature and uh, oxygen, but they cost thousands to tens of thousands of dollars. And so in our uh, talks with our mentors, what we learned is that they, some of them like Spash and Kachoba already have methods for doing frugal versions of these. So the frugal shaker flask is just a two liter Pepsi bottle, which has the same baffled bottoms as, as a glass flask uh, and, and can uh, work in sort of the same way. And then Sebastian's developed a frugal bioreactor design that can do a four liter reactor volume, mix and oxygenate the culture with an aquarium pump and only costs about $180 in components. So like a tenfold cheaper than the cheapest uh, bioreactors. Um, and then in terms of extracting proteins from the cells, so the standard method for doing this is you either sonicate the cells, you know, so you make rip them open with ultrasound, or you do French pressing, which rips them open with high pressure. Both of those equipment uh, instruments are really expensive, thousands of dollars. And then after you've done that, you have to centrifuge down the cell pellet uh, and get get rid of all the fra cell fragments. And refrigerated centrifuges cost thousands to tens of thousands of dollars. So our approach here again, we're secreting our enzymes, so hopefully we can avoid. Uh, the need to pop the cells, just bypass uh, uh, all the sonic here and French press stuff. Uh, and so we're designing wetware for doing this with, with B subtilis and with PKS secretion right now. Um, and then in order to separate out the cells, uh, we're, we're using an approach that Sebastian recommended, which is flocculation. So you can basically add like alum or other things uh, to the mixture and just causes the cells to clump together and then they settle out and you don't need any centrifuge. So you can skip that uh, hardware. 
Uh, and then in terms of how do you purify the actual proteins, so the standard method in the labs here is generally like some sort of chromatography, like immobilized metal affinity chromatography or IMAC, but nickel uh, IMAC resin, which is the most common thing you use, hundreds of dollars for a few mils of the resin, and the instruments, the chromatography instruments are ten thousands to tens of thousands of dollars. And so for there are a few different approaches here, depending on the enzyme. For thermostable enzymes, we're pursuing just secretion and heat purification. So you just secrete it out of the cells, uh, pellet cells get that group, and then the secreted stuff, you just heat up the mixture and the thermostable enzymes like fusion DNA polymerase, they'll stay stable, but everything else uh, sort of denatures in the heat and, and uh, settles out. And so that's a, that's a nice easy way to purify that, that's cheap. And then for reagent grade enzymes, about 90% purity, we're pursuing secretion and dialysis. So dialysis, it actually uses cellulose membranes. So it's, it's you know, it's like paper manure. Um, uh, but for, uh, it's, it's a way of basically getting everything that's smaller than your protein uh, to diffuse out of the, the dialysis tubing. And we've, uh, we learned from Sebastian Kachova that while sort of dialysis clips that are sold can cost like tens of dollars, um, potato chip bag clips that cost like a few dollars each are equivalent and just as good. Um, and then finally, for high purity applications, we're pursuing secretion and then a frugal chromatography column. And uh, Dushant Sivaratnam is really helping us here because he's developed methods for extracting silica from sand and then purifying enzymes with that silica. Um, and then in terms of quantifying yield and purity, the standard methods here, you use a page gel or a Western blot to see like uh, uh, the size of the things that are in your mixture, a Bradford assay for quantifying uh, how much protein content there is in a mixture. And then for pharmaceutical proteins, you need to do like some sort of detection of bacterial endotoxins as you need an en enzymatic approach there. And so our approach is uh, for quantification for reagent grade enzymes, we, we want to uh, quantify yield with fluorescent protein tags because it's much cheaper, it doesn't require all the reagents. Um, and we're hoping to leverage the frugal plate redesign that Manu's lab has developed there. Um, and then in the future for protein purity and, uh, and contaminant analysis, we want to pursue frugal page or uh, production of the enzymes required for endotoxin detection reactions. Um, so as next steps, we're going to continue our wetware design, submit designs for synthesis by free genes. Keone's already agreed to build and test fusion polymerase production designs for us because he needs fusion. Um, we're going to build and test Sebastian Kachoba's frugal bioreactor design, and we're going to partner with mentors, other teams, reach out to more people, get more people on board to start testing these fermentation and purification uh, protocols. And uh, so that's our team. It's a really great team. Uh, everybody's really cool. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. So just a quick comment, and I think we should continue the questions on the chat. I just want to make sure we don't run out of time. Uh, it would be valuable if you guys, uh, in terms of a target, uh, I mean, of course, there's so many high value enzymes, uh, but if you were to force to choose one, has the team discussed that, that let's develop a pipeline for one, and hence uh, we'll be able to prove, uh, you know, proof of principle and actually do some cost analysis. Yeah, our first target's gonna be fusion um, because uh, we already know at least one person, Keone, who needs a lot of that, that enzyme mm -hmm. and it just came off patent. Uh, and uh, uh, so, yeah, that's, that's the first one we're going after. And then, and then what, we'll scale, uh, what scale uh, has it been chosen in terms of just the amount and cost at which it will become feasible? So, I mean, if we did it with like Sebastian's frugal bioreactor, we should be able to make enough fusion in like one run if we get a, if we get a good construct to do like hundreds of thousands of PCR reactions. Like th that's how much enzyme, mm -hmm. that's how little enzyme you need for a PCR reaction. That's how much we can make. So mm -hmm. uh, large scale. Yeah, yeah, and I think yeah, no, that's very valuable because of the the then you get to choose for a given volume. You can choose all the downstream technologies have to handle that volume. That's why I'm thinking of just really put target and prices on these because it'll help you choose certain technologies might be out because they don't handle that volume. Yeah, definitely. Uh, okay, let's keep continuing. Uh, I guess the next is Micah, uh, Micah Mines. And then continue the questions on the chat because I think we're gonna run out of time. So I wanna make sure that uh, there is a thread of questions that people can address. Okay. So the MICA team, uh, Archana, go ahead. Uh, 
uh, yeah so uh, this is our team mycomine so our problem statement is can we design extraction tool to replace child labor from mycomine so why it is important to work on this problem so there is a uh, community and a large amount of people still working in a very dangerous situation to extract mica from the mines and uh, most of the mica mines are illegal and there is no machinery available and there is no technology for all this extraction tool so yeah it is very important to look to those community also and work for those so um, affected community so uh, india madagascar china sri lanka and pakistan this are the most affected country and uh, uh, the number of children uh, we don't have actually actual data of how many children are working in the mica mines and uh, how many people are affected to this so this is the rough data that we got like 22000 children only in india working in the mica mines so uh next is a uh, challenges so we have different kind of challenges here first is like social challenges uh this include the unclear and weak informants or uh, in for enforcement of uh, legal framework because all most of the mica mines are illegal so it's very hard to uh, uh, provide a, a good work environment around those mica mines and also the place Uh, like in jharkhand most of the communities and the uh, working on the mica mines are under represented and under served and they have a uh, lack of health and education facilities and uh, also the big issue is uh, poverty and political instability uh, the next challenge is for us is like limitation of uh, research and data uh, we have very less amount of data uh, mostly because of all of this mycomines are illegal government don't have actual actual data and uh, like how much uh, mica is extracted from the mines and what what is the total demand and what is the import export ratio we don't have any kind of data not uh, not also uh, amount of people working in those uh, situation and what about uh, their health care facilities and all uh, also the companies and authorities like big big company that are also uh, connected to this mica mines uh, link uh, they don't provide any kind of information because they know that uh, at somewhere the illegal uh, mining is there and child labor are working in that so they they don't actually want to talk about this or actually they don't have any data so uh, this is our big, biggest challenge uh, because there is no uh, historical data and no literature work we have to start from uh, beginning like and also for that uh, uh, we have the technical challenge like um, uh, there is no ground technical work in the mica mine Uh, also the um, shape and variation of size of mica is very is very uh, from like nanometer particle to like anything we don't have actually data like uh, the shape and size of variation but it's very from long range also mica is available in different form and uh, so let's come about the mica so uh, this is the property of mica that is a lightweight flexible strong chemically inherent and this is high temperature and uh, it's also the application you are all know uh, about the application it's uh, in uh, in electronics paints and it's all our day to day life so and so uh, this is the important thing like how the uh, mining of sheet mica is currently extracting so people or do all the work by the hand from picking the mica to collecting to doing all the work is done by hand and uh, by the people there is no machinery nothing is available so uh, why there is no machinery for mica mines the first thing is uh, um, most of the mica mines are illegal and low, uh, because of low labor cost and uh, um, most of the mines are inside the forest uh that uh, that is also the issue and also uh, companies are very irresponsible about this matter and lack of strong labor law um 
so um, we have some question like what if we legalize the microminds so advantage so we have advantage if we regulate the uh, microminds that solve the employment problem of the villagers and provide the good daily wages but our challenge is that like if we legalize the uh, microminds then it may be hazardous to environment because most of the uh, microminds especially in jharkhand are in the forest and uh, if we legalize that then this cover lots of the forest water level and air quality so the microminds are initially uh, almost 700 mines are legally legal uh, before but now uh, after uh, like in 90s uh, um after to 20 and 90s uh, this all all are illegal and the, the government stopped because of this environmental problem so uh, what this effect on the microminds uh, may help uh, if we legalize the mines this uh, this may or may not help uh, uh, in the child labor problem because the, uh, for example the coal mines is also regulated by the um uh, government but still a uh, child are working in that mines also so we cannot say that this is solve the problem and next is what uh, if we introduce the machinery to micro mines so the advantage is of course uh, people easily collect the all the mines and in less amount of time they can collect more work and get more amount but um, why challenge is here how, how can we implement uh, Uh, this machinery because most of the micro mines are illegal and uh, why would company support this machinery because they are getting micro of almost about zero labor cost so uh, this there are some big questions behind this also uh, this may solve the uh, uh, reduce the number of children working in mines uh, as the family will get the uh, high income as compared to also the third option is like what if we we'll provide the alternative livelihood uh, then people will no, no longer to be forced to work risk their life and force in the illegal mining and can have a better livelihood and, and also the challenges is there to providing the in uh, in source of income in that environment because the soil quality is very bad and agriculture is not to, there is a solution and also there is people are not very educated and skilled to do any other work uh, they have the custom like working on the mines collecting mines so this is also the issue and other is yeah uh, narrow down the problem or this is the complex problem and there is many sub problem but we are uh, currently we are looking for the technical solution so uh we look some of the technical solution that are presently available in our um, um, mines industry and the other in industry and the uh, one is the optical shorting and we think that this might be work in the micro mines uh, but we are not sure about that because we don't have much data and sample and other is all uh, is density separation Uh, because uh, the density of mica is very low so this might also work for uh, uh, in mica mine industry so uh, so for future work uh, technical work direction so the first thing is to try to get raw sample directly from the mines and identify the other minerals and elements present in it that also the map the shape and size and other physical property also try to find out the answer why there is no machinery available for micro mines is there any technical challenge behind that uh, this is a big question and list down all the challenges and look for the available technology present in other industry that can solve this problem or also if that will work then just make it crucial and if uh, there is no technology available and that will work for this then just uh, invent a new fuel way also uh, for alternative livelihood uh, the first step is to monitor the place soil availability and the quality of water climate rain for etc all the things and just look for the other option like what kind of crop can people grow on that type of soil 
soil quality and also train people to for other work. So uh, for conclusion, uh, there is not much research done in the field of mycelium extraction. And so making it legal is like a, a difficult challenge for us because we don't have data and other information people uh, all, only working on the ethical way and the criticizing the child level in the microbiome. But for the uh, technology point of view, we have, uh, we have nothing actually. So we have to uh, work on the ground level and, and uh, start from this scratch. So yeah, we will continue this later. And uh, what we can do is we can provide a, a good quality, cost-effective synthetic. Uh, there is synthetic mica present in the market, but a demand of natural mica or seed mica is still very high. So we can uh, also look to the that problem, like what we can do to increase the um, demand of synthetic mica also to provide the alter alternative jobs to the uh, mining workers so and also a good education and quality for the children and the most important effective law enforcement in there uh, so we are uh, as we are getting deeper and deeper into the this problem we are just coming up with the new challenges uh, so, yeah, we will continue this for the long time. Uh, this will not going to solve in the short time. Uh, thank you. That's fantastic, Archana. And I think, you know, I just want to highlight the, uh, first of all, taking on a very complex uh, challenge, but also sharing this with the broader uh, class and team as well that it's often you have to be multifaceted when you're approaching these because, of course, it's you can go and run in one direction and not realize uh, the implications and especially the social barriers around technology development. Uh, one quick comment, and then we should just catch up separately as well. Uh, I think your comment reminded me, of course, uh, density-based separation is used in agriculture very broadly in how mm -hmm. husk is separated out. Uh, yeah. And I'm wondering whether the types of instruments and the design that are just traditionally used in wheat husk might be applicable uh, and tuned towards mica separation. Because, of course, the way mica would behave falling in air because of this thin sheet capacity, it's not just actual density, but it's drag in air would be very different from particles that are not sheet-like. And that yeah. is similar in characteristics to what might happen in husk. So let's follow up on that front. Uh, and again, I think uh, I just want to emphasize this point that this is one team that has really taken on um, the view that is multifaceted and it's actually very inspirational. So, uh, okay, I think we have, we're running out of time. So let's run to the, the last three teams. Uh, the next is plant antimicrobial discovery team. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. I'll share my screen right now. Okay, so we are the Plant Antimicrobial Discovery Team. My name is Rocio and I'm going to be speaking on behalf of my team. So here in the first slide, you can see our first goal. Uh, that was how we can create a multi-part affordable kit and here in the next slide, you can see that we have just switched our focus and we have different um, goals here. For example, we have um, how, we can, uh, how we can grow bacteria and the instruments we're going to work, um, we're going to create to do that. So also we are focused on data and how we can collect data and how that can later be crowdsourced so we can uh, be displayed publicly for people and researchers. Also, we want to um, attack the educational component that this kid has. So we can introduce antimicrobial resistance to different audiences like school kids, for example. So for this class, we uh, asked ourselves if there was a way that we could create an affordable microbial incubator that is accessible to anyone and anywhere in the globe. So since our main goal was to test if plants show uh, bacterial uh, anti 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 uh, bacterial um, resistance, uh, we wanted to grow 
uh, microbes in a vessel and in a nutrient media at a warm temperature. But since the temperature changes um, around the world as you move anywhere globally, uh, we thought that developing this incubator could assist in our task of growing bacteria anywhere in the shortest amount of time. So we came up with our frugal incubation incubator, which is this 3D printer microbial incubator that anyone with the blueprints and access to a 3D printer can, can access. So this is a prototype and this prototype aims to regulate temperature and carbon dioxide uh, levels uh, to maintain an internal um, atmosphere ideal for microbial control. So our incubator is about 23 centimeters tall and it should weigh uh, less than three pounds empty. It can hold up to five plastic tubes, five microtubes and three petty dishes simultaneously. But however, since this is a 3D printer uh, incubator, the design can be you know, uh, changed and adapted uh, and be modified to whatever the needs of the experiments are. So here you can see the deconstruction of our incubator. So the size makes it portable and easily accessible to anyone. As you may know, uh, incubators vary in price depending on their specification. Cheaper ones start in the low $500 and the complex ones can go as high as $20,000. So these price ranges are not very permissive to many budgets, especially in educational settings and in remote areas. These incubators may not be readily available or cost permissive to people. Therefore, we task ourselves to create and prototype this incubator that is about 47 to 75 dollars. But because this is a prototype, the prices are still high. So we're still working on how we can reduce the cost of it. Anyhow, this is still uh, economical and innovative in a solution for the expensive and not always available uh, incubator. So here you can see the electronic components, which are like the most expensive part of our um, solution right now. The, um, this con these components will control the temperature. For example, the heat source will be LED lights, and an extractor fan that can circulate the air and allow the exchange of it through the HEPA filter cover in the vent, uh, vent in the incubator, sorry. And then the sensors that will feed into an Arduino that will display the information into a digital screen. So yeah, this is our team and we're still working on our prototype. We are really excited, excited uh, for our project because even though this has like a, our main aim is like a scientific, scientific um, like um, we want to approach a, a problem that is mainly scientific. We also want to incorporate science into classrooms and, and make it open source to everyone. So yeah, uh, you can visit our Notion page if you have any ideas or if you want to work with, with us in the model or you have any suggestions with the um, design of our incubator. So yeah, we want to thank Dr. Ashley Stasinski that helped us with uh, our medium for the bacterial growth and Manu for the amazing idea of like uh, focus especially on the incubator. So yeah, that's it. This is very exciting. And actually you've made uh, incubators uh, fun to actually <laughs> even look at and have. I, I was thinking about it as saying, huh, I want five of them. We literally have a lab shut down. That's why I'm sitting outside because there is no power in an entire building. And all morning we were juggling to figure out how are we gonna maintain our cultures. So exactly. many, many days of thinking about too. this. Exactly, yeah. 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 Uh, okay. I think we're going to run out of time. If people are okay, can we stretch 10 more minutes and cover two more teams? People are okay with that? All right. Thank you so much. Uh, let's jump to negotiation villain. Thanks, so Manu. Thanks. That's also Sarah. pretty high up on the, the top names of projects. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I think that was a fantastic, uh, fantastic presentation just now. Actually, uh, thank you, Rocio. Um, so our project is slightly uh, different. It's an education kind of project. We want to create a cost-free 
solution for negotiation coaching. Do you want to so, share your screen? Yes, uh, I'm actually going to show a demo video. So okay. prototype that we have built. So let me just play the video. Can you, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you and it's just loading up. Hello. How would you like to negotiate can for you today? Hear it, can you hear the audio? We I'm can like... hear the audio. Oh, is this a good context for our negotiation practice? The following is a salary negotiation between the player and AI. The player is the employee. AI is a friendly boss. AI knows negotiation tactics and wants to help the player. AI wants to know why the player wants a raise and why the player should get a raise. Yes, that sounds good. Let's get started. Conversation starting in 3.2.1. Point point Please kick it off. Hi, boss. Um, I wonder if I could get a, get a raise for next year. Why do you want to raise? I have worked very hard last year and I have brought $1 million revenue for the company. I think I deserve a raise. How will I benefit from giving you a raise? I will work even harder next year. So that was actually the first um, channel that the user can talk with the bot and the second channel is through text messaging so here we're still using a trial account from Twilio so you can still see the trial account uh, label on top um, the first step um, is to um, input sort of a negotiation topic and uh, in here um, the bot will first generate a description with the user see if that is good as setting and the user can sort of uh, um, modify and, and provide more context uh, to the bot. And then um, when the dialogue actually happens, it's hitting uh, GPT-3. It's the state-of-the-art natural language processing uh, component that's re released by OpenAI this year. And uh, yeah, so the the AI is generating the response here, actually. And the last time that uh, we presented at the um, um, office hour session, uh, we had this question about whether we want the bot to go just free form, very creative, instead of providing like a templated uh, approach. So right now we are doing a hybrid. Uh, we are giving prompts to the AI. So each turn of the conversation, uh, we tell the bot what the goal of this turn of the conversation is. So the bot will create uh, um, responses within a guideline uh, rather than going free form. And um, we have also read some negotiation books. There are certain important questions that the user should better address. And we are using the bot to prompt the user to guide the user through the negotiation. And some of the key questions that we can see, we can see are um, like, why do you want it? Or uh, how, like, how am I going to benefit from, uh, from, from like giving you this uh, um, like, a, like a race? Or uh, I don't agree, do you have a better alternative? And we took a phase approach for this project. There were three phases being planned for this project through these 10 weeks. And we have uh, successfully accomplished the first two phases. Phase number one was to achieve the end-to-end -end connectivity um, uh, from, from the bot to a Google Dialogflow, which is a wrapper and, um, uh, platform, and then to the user's end device. So that was phase number one. And the second phase was to code in this kind of guided negotiation um, uh, uh, step. And uh, phase number three was to 
there is some sort of feedback uh, or scoring for the user um, say how the user have performed in terms of providing a convincing um, uh, um, input or uh, how friendly the user was. So we had done a research, but currently there is no open source um, tool for creating that. So we will need to wait until that kind of tool becomes open source and we can incorporate. So this bot is actually fully functioning. Uh, if I provide you the phone number, you can also talk to it. Uh, the <laughs> only technical problem is that when multiple people talk to the bot at the same time, it will sort of mix up uh, multiple sessions together, so there's no way to distinguish. And uh, there's also a technical issue we need to solve. There are actually uh, several more issues uh, <laughs> that we need to deal with. Um, if you are, uh, if you want to try this out, you can private message me and I will give you the phone number. Okay, that's the end of the demo and end of the presentation. That's fantastic. This is a great way of also keeping a presentation on time. Uh, so many people already are excited about talking. So let's follow up on offline on that front. And I think one thing that would be valuable for you, Evelyn, to also just do a user feedback survey. So if you take 10 students from the class who actually mm -hmm. use it and then ask them after that conversation, how do they feel in terms of a gradient? Just collect some data on your side. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would be great. And when you actually try to let me know any feedback that you have, you will, you will be my guinea pigs. Actually. <laughs> People are going crazy on the chat. I can see. I, okay, let's keep moving. Uh, let's do the last team, Team Fisheye. Hi, folks. Go ahead, John. So uh, we are right back to a depressing topic now. <laughs> <clears throat> so we are Team Fishai, and we are trying to solve the microplastics problem by helping detecting them. And this is a summary of what we've been doing for the what we've been doing for for the last uh, few weeks. Next slide, Sidhu. So we have a general consensus that it, that the image on the left on, on your left is bad, pumping stuff from deep under the earth and pushing them all around us. But uh, uh, let's remember that the image on the right is exactly the same same problem. <clears throat> Next slide. So there is a deficit uh, about the estimate uh, between the estimates of what we know that we're putting into our borders and what we are actually able to measure from the water. And that number is 99%. Uh, <clears throat> microplastics are already in our food chain and they greatly affect the marine ecosystem and also can potentially act as brain tracks for dangerous microbes so they can become non living disease vectors at some point if they uh, actually are not already. So what is the rule of this problem? So the expert opinion is we don't know what these plastics are doing. And the rule of the problem is we still do not have a scalable method that can easily be employed to measure the amount of microplastics that pollute our water bodies. And this is where our project comes in. <clears throat> the image on the right shows the river map of the US and uh, it's easily evident that the, the cumulative length of the shoreline, I mean, uh, the river banks far exceeds the coastal line. And more people interact with river water, river water on a daily basis. So we decided to focus on inland borders. Next slide, Simba. The solution we are pursuing uses the technique of impedance spectroscopy. So there's a decision tree on the notion page that outlines how we got here. And so for the purposes of the demonstration, just imagine two parallel plates. Next, next, next slide, Simba. <clears throat> so yeah, thanks, Simba. Uh, imagine two parallel plate electrodes with the water sample between them, and it mainly contains water and some organic matter and some scattered microplastics. So we measure the impedance, uh, how the impedance varies across this capacitor for different samples at different frequencies. And due to the difference in the dielectric, dielectric properties of these materials, we should get signature signals that enable us to quantify and characterize the materials in the sample. And for now, we are concentrating on the quantifying part. So moving on to the next slide, <clears throat> we need an impede of, to, to, to perform impedance <laughs> spectroscopy. We need a frequency generator and a reader. So initially, none of us had access to an electronic slab because of the strange year we are living in. So we built a sound card oscilloscope, which is just connecting uh, your microphone uh, aux cable to um, 
you you actually have to cut the cut the piece out and connect the wires so that you can uh, read the signals. Uh, but the problem with these are these are limited at the auditory range of human beings, so 22 kilohertz. Sad. So where are we at? So uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, for testing out our prototypes, we also need to make microplastic samples. So how do we how do we do that? Uh, the expert opinion is we have to, we can use our scissors to make uh, pretty good samples, and all it takes is a lot of patience. Moving into the next slide. So we are at uh, a stage where we made some rough calculations and went ahead and made a prototype already. And when we took it to the lab, the signals were quite unsteady because of multiple reasons, especially the robustness, the way you connect it to the system, because uh, each connector can act as, its, as a separate capacitance system on its own. So uh, the, after talking to our mentors, uh, we decided to do a, 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 make a deep dive into the calculations a bit more. And the two approaches that we are currently at are a high fidelity multiphysics approach and a lower order mathematical sampling. Mathematical modeling of sam uh, samples as, also as, as capacitors. So the next graph uh, on the next slide shows the impedance response of the configuration shown on the left. So the next step for us would be to do the same since the same calculation for multiple configurations and see if there is a tiny range of frequencies that we can focus on, which can in, uh, bring down the cost incredibly, incredibly well. <clears throat> So for the next few slides, we are showing the results of the lower order mathematical modeling. Uh, the MATLAB code is shared on a Notion page and please feel free to play around with it. So uh, what we are trying to do here is making parameter sweeps of the parallel play capacitance model that we made. So uh, it naturally follows that if you have to increase the sensitivity, sensitivity of a plastic uh, counter, uh, it, would, uh, it would be better to uh, confine these particles so uh, what is the limit of confinement that we can hope for? At the same time, we do not want to confine much because uh, the aim is to go for high throughput. So what are the other, other methods to improve the sensitivity of, of the device in itself? So on the next slide, we can see that the, uh, by manipulating the properties of the thin insulator that's uh, based on the electrode, uh, you can actually improve the sensitivity by a bit. And it follows that the thinner the insulating material, the higher the, higher the sensitivity. And also the higher the dial to constant of that material, the higher the sensitivity. But these are like coupled problems. So for us, the uh, immediate steps um, forward are mainly computational. So we need to plug in these capacitance values to impedance values and see if this uh, gives us a, a reasonable range. And we need to dig in and understand the problem a bit more theoretically before we build our next prototype. We are also looking at how to use a network analyzer that people use while laying network cables as managed register for impedance measurement. And uh, we are also uh, apparently coming, uh, trying to come up with a meaningful unit to express microplastic concentrations in a, with something that's similar to AQI that's uh, meaningful, the air quality index that's meaningful and easily out of by people. To conclude, uh, the image in our mind about the device is a dispenser bottle hanging from a tree on a river side uh, with the samples flowing intermittently through a stack of capacitors like models. And we are quite positive that it will work out. We would like to thank all our mentors, uh, the classmates, and all the people who have uh, allowed us to use their labs uh, around our individual spaces. We are spread throughout the world. And Sonali's siblings who are helping us with the electronics. Our commitment to the problem is no means limited by uh, the due date or the formal requirements of this course. We will keep learning and keep working on it, and we welcome you all to join us for the support. Since uh, we are the last team presenting today, today's assignment is on us. So <laughs> uh, we named our team Fisheye because while at the time we were reading the uh, immense amount of material that Professor Emmanuel sent us, it was on optical methods for detecting um, microplastics. So since we are at an electric uh, electronic mother right now, we would like a better name for the device that we are finally going to make. And uh, that's the assignment. Thanks a lot. That was fantastic. And I'm very excited that you guys took on the challenge of mathematically modeling first, the because one of the factors that ends up happening in, and this is true for all projects, uh, 
there is a very long way that all of you can go if you take the take a step back and just calculate. It's a really important uh, uh, lesson to learn in in the design process itself. So that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, we're going to continue these talks uh, next week. Sorry, it took 15 minutes longer. We'll have to figure out a way, but probably the sets of discussions and giving people a little more freedom rather than running it as an exact five minute, it probably is a better approach. Uh, and I think one of the things that I'll try to do is after uh, next week's uh, talks, uh, I'll schedule another one-on-one uh, -on -one sit downs with every team to make sure, especially all the teams that are interested in continuing their projects to solidify a discussion. And so this is not going to be a joint, uh, but uh, this will be a sign up time that individual teams will sign up so we can make sure uh, that we have a certain sense of a continuity associated with these projects. I'm absolutely blown away with just, uh, I mean, the opening itself was pretty high bar with a, a vacuum from a syringe. So you all met the kind of a challenge that I was hoping for that we will achieve in this class. So I'm actually very proud of this at the moment. And of course, we still have lots of good stuff to come next week. So good luck on the presentations. Uh, make sure that you share the videos so we can look through the videos. And uh, it would be valuable that before Thursday, for sure, everybody would share the video so we can turn and keep the clock running uh, much more precisely next week. Do you know, Tyler, what the date is for the sharing the videos, the 10 minutes? Yeah, so, yeah those, those should be shared by Thursday, the 19th before class. Okay. Um, and as soon as you can, or as soon as you're done with it, uh, do share it so that we can take a look before class as well. Yeah, because I wanna make sure that everybody in the class has had the chance to look through everybody's work. And then there is a link to a Notion page. Maybe we should standardize, Tyler. We should send a template for what the first slide should look like. It should have a link of Notion page. It should have a list of people, a title. So it's a little bit standardized so people can very quickly find the links. Yeah, that's a good idea. I do also have a, a Google sheet with all the Notion links and I'll post that again on Discord so everyone can access that. Yeah, I think it's very important at this point for all of you to provide feedback to other projects as well. Uh, so on that note, uh, congratulations on, uh, this was a fantastic session and we'll see each other uh, next week on Thursday. Bye everyone. Awesome work everyone. See you all on Thursday.